What's up, Vet TV? I'm here with Stephen Leonard. Stephen is an award-winning faculty member at the University of Kansas School of Business. Uh, Steve serves there as a senior assistant dean and professor of practice. He's former senior military strategist and the creative force uh, behind the microblog Doctrine Man. Steve is also a career writer and a speaker with a passion for developing and mentoring the next generation of thought leaders. Steve, did I leave anything out? Can you fill us in if I did? No, no, that's 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 pretty much it. That's what I've tried to do for a long time is is try to be somebody who could help bring other people along and help grow other people and then share the share the things I learned along the way, the the struggles that I may have had, the mistakes I may have made to help other people not do the same kinds of things and then find their own ways. So yeah. I'm glad because I feel like a lot of what I want to cover with you today is not only to talk about you and where you come from, but where you hope to be in the future. And then also for the people who are watching to emulate what you've done, what you're doing, and possibly what you're going to do in the future so they can be like you without having to make all the big messy mistakes. So I have to ask, you're a creative, as a creative person, what do you feel is the specific emotion? that drives you to create something that others can genuinely connect to? That's a, that's a, you know, I hate to say that you got me with a good question, but you did. That's, you like that um, one? <laughs> I, I don't know what, I, it's, it's a good question because I've really never thought about it in those terms. What drives me? Yeah. I think uh, probably deep down, I just have a, a, a drive to create. Yeah. And uh, create content that makes a difference for people, whether it's, you know, my I have a I have a weekly opinion column that comes yeah. out. You know, I try to share lessons through that. I've tried to do it through cartoons. Yeah. I've done it through books. I do it online. It's it's always done with, you know, maybe I can connect with one person here or there and make a difference for them and help them along. Uh, and, and that drive keeps me doing it and yeah. has for uh probably the a good last 12, 13 years of, you know, constant uh, engagement. Uh, I certainly don't do it because it's fun, but I do it because I feel like there's a need out there that the, the, the more of us as veterans who help each other, the better this world is. And, you know, and we all, we all can do a part if we take the time to do it. Sounds like a passion for being able to be a mentor, like being in a position to where you can, work with transference and giving information to younger people and that's good because that's what i wanted to talk to you about today it sounds like there's i don't know are, are you a father may i ask oh yeah i got three kids all, all my kids uh, my youngest is 27 so and my oldest is th 34 so we have them all spread out but i also have um I still call my undergraduate students my kids yeah and so they're all you know 20 21 years old and i do this same thing with them I do with everybody else, which makes it a lot of fun, is class is less about um, the topic of the day than it is, how do I set those kids up for success, those students up for success, yeah. because they're going to go out into the workforce, and what do you need to be successful in the world? When you're 20 years old, you really don't know, and so it helps to have somebody say, hey, look, this is what you can expect. Um and probably one of my favorite things to tell business school students is, you know, nobody really cares how nice a Excel spreadsheet you can make, but they do care that you bring value to the workforce yeah. and that you're a contributing member of that 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 uh, that business, and that you make a difference for people. That's what right. they care about. That, that you know, when they turn to you, you have a smart answer. You're 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 intelligent. You're you're articulate that you can carry yourself well, they care about about that. That's yeah. what makes a difference. And so what do we do as, as grownups in this world to bring along that next generation? And that that's the same kind of thing that we do in the military. You know, you're bringing along that next generation and just take that mindset and apply it to a different group of people. Yeah. Which I have fun with because, you know, you read all the stuff that people say about, oh, Gen X this and Gen X that. And, oh, you know, all they want to do is know why. And, and they always want to argue. I deal with these these kids every day. And you know what? They're no different than we were. 
absolutely no different yeah. than we were. It's, you know, they want to know what they need to do in the world and, and they want to, they want to have some adult leadership and guidance in that world. And yeah. that's, that's not a hard thing to do, honestly. It's kind of fun. So would you say your, your mission statement could be um, that being a mentor is your passion? Being a mentor is your passion. Making a difference is even better. So difference. yeah, mentorship, but making a difference for other people. Yeah. And and I think that's a big deal because I mean, how many of us never have a mentor or not really or a distant mentor? I was one of those, right? And I may have been I may have been a really hard person to mentor. I don't know. I'm sure if you ask some of the people I worked for, they will tell you I was a pain in the ass and I was hard to get to go where they wanted me to go. But you know, people need that in their lives, mm-hmm. and all people need that. It's, it, you know, they need advice, they need uh, coaching, mentoring. Uh, and, you know, if you put forth a little bit of effort, the the return is huge and they appreciate it and it, it makes a difference for them. And, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to hear years later, wow, you know, you said this one thing to me yeah. and it made a huge difference. Would the military version of you, the military version of you, be surprised with where you are at today? Oh, uh, you know, the, here's a conversation I had this morning with somebody because I was talking to a buddy of mine who um, is probably going to retire in a year, uh, serving brigade commander. And I told him, as I as you know, kind of offering some advice, and I said, this is how I did it. And this is how I would recommend everybody who transitions. Find those things that define you in uniform and hold on to them. It's your work ethic. Maybe it's your sense of humor. Uh, maybe it's the fact that you get up every day and do three, four, five miles. Uh, find those things that really define you and hold on to them, because those are the things that make you transition to a civilian, yeah. and that transition goes smoothly. Um, and, and you know what? That's who you are, really. Uh, you know, we joked earlier about you, know, you could just grow a beard and go out and shoot, which you can yeah. do too. But, you know, what are those things that define you that you, that are consistent? And I said, hey, for me, I still work out every single day. There isn't a day that I don't work out. And I've run three days a week. And, you know, I still get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning. You know, yeah. My dog gets me up, but I still get up. Um, and then I still I still curse like I always did. Yeah. Something we were joking about <laughs> earlier. I, I never lost that. Uh, that part of me or or my sense of humor you know it was always defined who i was that i was you know call me a smart ass whatever but it was always there and it still is um those are the things that made me successful in uniform that continue to make me successful it's all the same things yeah. um it's uh it's just a different uniform and I've had like I got a okay I don't have a University of Kansas shirt on today but I have friends that will say I traded one uniform for another because almost every day I'll have a KU uh, polo on or something like that and either jeans or dockers. But, you know, I, I wear essentially the same stuff all the time and it's a comfortable uniform switch. Uh yeah, you know, I, I try. I could try to dress like you, but I'm not sure I could do that, Matt. I, I, you know, I work at it. I get that way on the weekends. Um, I think you. Uh, just I cooler. will definitely make an attempt. But yeah, I think you hold on to those things, and that allows you to maintain your personal identity, and it also helps you not lose touch with who you were before. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge issue for people: is that you try to be something that you're not when you transition, and in in that in that sense, you lose who you were before mm. and you're already losing a lot of your identity, but yeah. try to hold on to those pieces. So, you know, you don't lose, you don't lose yourself completely. Does that, does that make sense? hundred percent makes sense. So if we're talking about you now from the military and going forward to talk about you in the future, what do you feel like is the biggest time waster that took from you from well, let me rephrase this because I really want to say this right for you too. What was the biggest time waster? What was the thing that held you back from becoming who you are today? I'm 34, okay? I need to get to where you're at in life and our audience who's <laughs> watching needs to get there in life. What do we skip over? If we want, if we were in your field, if we're, what would you say to us? So I, I always say that, you know, 
what gets in the way of being who you're meant to be and being the best version of yourself yeah. possible. Cause you want to be the best version of Matt possible. Yeah. You got to be who you were meant to be. You can't be somebody else. You, you have to be singularly focused on who you are, who you want to be yeah. and, and just relentlessly work towards that. Yeah. So, you know, in your head who you want to be, don't take no for an answer. Just keep pushing, be yourself. Don't listen to anybody outside there don't don't listen to any naysayers you want to be you you want to be the best version of you possible um and that's something that like when i talk to my undergrads we actually in strategy class we do this i, I teach a business strategy class mm -hmm. as their capstone and the first six weeks of the class is all spent on uh personal development okay. so you set goals. What are, what are your goals in life? And then we start to work towards those goals. We put them in a strategic context that we end up using later on. But that first six weeks is all about growing the best version of you that you can and how you do that. And I tell them, this is how we put all this stuff in context. Because the reality is, you know, there's not somebody waiting to invite us into the boardroom and say, hey, Matt, we want you to design the, the future strategy for uh, Apple. Nobody's doing that. But you do have the opportunity to develop yourself and having a plan for that and understanding how to measure that and work towards that. Um, that's useful. And that's something you can always do. And um, boy, I think we got off topic there, but yeah, that's, that's, that's for me. That's, that's, no, that's you, what it's all about. You led me into, okay, we're going to say that we stayed on topic because it works perfectly. You segued us into the next question. So I'm really happy about that too. <laughs> if you had to talk to your future self, what do you think he'd tell you he wished you would just shut up already and accomplish so that he could be where he needs to be? Oh, yeah. So, so I think you have to look at future self, past self. Yeah. So past self, hey, just focus on what you want to be and, and work towards that. Future self would probably look back and say, okay, you needed to learn to say no to more people. Um that people people always will ask a lot of you, especially the more productive and creative and out you know outgoing you are, the more people are going to ask of you. Future self will look back at you and say, Matt, you needed to learn to say no once in a while, because that no would have given yeah. you more time to work on you, yeah. and you needed that time. And I think that's what future self will always say back to me is, dude, why didn't you just say no once in a while? Why do you always say yes? Because and this was part of a conversation I had today is mm -hmm. the more you say yes, the more you have to find a way to carve that time out. And so where does that time come from? It's either personal time, it's family time, it's something else. It's it's never work time. And so you're 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 basically taking away from other people to do something for other people and you're not doing something for yourself. You're not doing something for your family. So future self says, Hey man, you need to learn to say no once in a while. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do because we're not, we're not wired to say no. We're mm -hmm. wired to say, Oh yeah, you need help. I got you covered. Um, no matter how many people ask you, you won't say no. You got to learn to say no once in a while, just for yourself, for your own sanity. You got to learn to say no. So I think a lot about givers and takers, right? And I feel like the givers, it's just in their DNA to want to, to help and assist and yeah. please. And, you know, that's the, that's the kind of like the salary mentality kind of thing to where they're invested in the company because it's almost in their DNA. Do you think those people can ever really learn to say no? Because, you know, are you, you're not a grandfather yet, are you? Yeah, I sure am. Oh, I, I bet you're the six. best grandfather ever because if you have a hard time yeah, saying no. It's a girl. She doesn't pay any attention to me. She <laughs> hangs out with her grandma. I'm I'm good for like, you know, I can take her to a toy store. I can get her ice cream, take her to the cookie, things like that. But otherwise she hangs out with her, her grandma. But no, you're right. Um, and this is crazy because this was the exact same conversation I had with somebody earlier about givers and takers and that givers just give and give and give and give yeah. and it's 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 hardwired into you because you grow up with a mental model of what work is and work is you put in the work you get the salary put in the work you get the salary the more you work the more you get the, in in your mind that works that way and so you don't say no because mm -hmm. doing whatever somebody asks you're giving and later on maybe you get something out of it maybe not 
that's really tough. It's really tough to break yeah. that cycle. And that's something that I dealt with um, when I first got out of the army and actually yeah. probably for a few years, I actually had some people that I worked with at the university who said, Hey, you got to learn to say no once in a while. It's okay to say no. I'm like, I don't know how to say no because we're brought up in a culture where you don't get to say no. Hey, we need you to go to Afghanistan. Yeah, no, I got oh, some other yeah. shit going on right now. I'm not going to be yeah. able to make it over there. Yeah, no. You get out in the real world and they say, hey, you know, Matt, we need you to go to San Francisco. Yeah, no, I got other shit going on. And they're like, oh, okay, well, let me know if you change your mind. It's okay. But you got to be able to say that. Do you feel like that might be, or what, better yet, what do you think is the biggest mistake that veterans or civilians make when they leave the military and they try and go in your field? When you talk to, you know, a guy my age or younger and they're trying to get into writing, get into being a creative, you know, not working in the sun for 12 hours a day, what's the biggest mistake they're making that holds uh, them back? So... There's a, that's a, that's a broad question to answer because there's a, there's a lot of different nuances to it. Um, probably the biggest one is people don't think they have a story to tell and we all have a story. Your story doesn't have to be a great story or an exciting story or a combat story. I mean, I can, I can look somebody in the eye and say, yeah, I know what it's like to be shot at, yeah. but I also know what it's like to drop my pistol in a barrel of human shit and have to dig it out with a hanger, yeah. which is a far more interesting story um, for me. And it, it makes people laugh, but you know, it, it kind of gets to, that's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody's got a story. That's the first thing. You, you got to have a story and yeah, your story might seem boring to you, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be boring to somebody else, especially if you can pull uh lessons out of if you can pull like the moral of the story uh like the, like the, what i tell the story of dropping my pistol in a barrel of crap in saudi yeah. arabia in 1990 the lesson was that i was too cool to tie a lanyard onto my pistol so i didn't because no real man would put a lanyard on his pistol yeah. well i had dysentery and my pistol fell out of my holster and i never ever after that date ever didn't put a lanyard on a pistol and people would say, why do you wear a lanyard on your pistol? Man, yeah. you only got to drop that thing in crap once and have to dig it out. You'll never do it twice. You learn that lesson. That's the moral of the story. Just yeah. suck it up and, and, and do what's right. The other thing um, uh, is this, just that whole idea of people have to get over the hump when when you're going to write a story. Mm -hmm. um, it, you got to get over, you got to you got to get past yourself. A lot of people will spend forever trying to write that first paragraph and they never get past the first paragraph. It's okay to skip it and go to the second one or the third one. And when I write, sometimes I can't get that early stuff in. So I'll go write like, okay, here's the, here's what I wanted to draw out of that for the ending. So I'll go write the ending and then work backwards from there. Um, you got to have a process and you got to be comfortable with your process and know that, you know, it's a story that you're going to tell so allow yourself the chance to tell the story, allow yourself to walk away from it. And that's, yeah. that's a big one. Um, and probably the other one is um, people get talking about process. People get really hamstrung around process and they'll say, um, I have to have an outline and I have to build my outline and they'll spend forever building an outline and they'll never write because the outline isn't right. So they won't go from the outline. Yeah. I've never used an outline. Uh, don't even try. I, I just like I just just th vomit words on a page and then and then rearrange them until they say what I want them to say because that is um, that is far more productive than just trying to say well section one section two subsection B you know yeah. and getting all caught up in that those things will slow you down when really all you want to do is sit down and just put pen to paper or or just get out and tell your story. And that's the other thing. I, I think the last piece of this would be the advice that I tell people is just tell a story. Yeah. Just tell your story. And, you know, if you need to tell it to people before you write it down, then do it. It's OK. Yeah. You know, practice the story, get it out of you. Um, and I usually before I write, I will go out and mow the lawn for two hours oh. and and I will push a lawnmower in, I don't care if it's 100 degrees outside, I will push that lawnmower and I will talk out whatever it is that I want to say. Let the ideas get, yeah. get because I'm not thinking. 
Yeah. It's just clear my head, push the lawn more, sweat, follow the follow the trail around, whatever. And then I can sit down, take a shower, then write. And it just comes. And so those 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 kind of things are, you know, uh, you you want to be a writer. That's yeah. how you be a writer. You figure yourself out. You tell your story. You don't get hamstrung around. I'm not exciting. Nobody cares. Yeah. I, I have to get the outline perfect or, you know, have it all thought through. You don't. You just kind of let it go. It's good advice for me. I've been trying to write a book for two years. Yeah, so, same here. <laughs> no, I mean, you're giving a lot of good advice and good information. And I, I'm glad that we have, you know, we have a chance to kind of say, all right, what you have done is some things that I would like to accomplish in my lifetime. And there's people who are watching who can relate to that, hopefully, right? If it's going to the right audience. Yeah. But the biggest thing is I didn't know about mentors. I didn't understand the concept of a mentor. I didn't know about a mentor. And I was lucky enough to find my first mentor at 26 or 27. And I still ask myself, why didn't I get a mentor sooner? What, was there something holding me back? Or did I not meet them? Did I not approach them in the right way? You know, when you're speaking to younger men, younger women, younger veterans, do you feel like some of them accidentally shun a potential mentor? Some do. And, and it's a, it's an interesting thing um, because I would say I was difficult to mentor in some ways, but I could separate it and say, I didn't have a lot of officer mentors until later on. My yeah. first mentor was my platoon sergeant. Yeah. And he and I would spend hours together, just bullshitting, drinking coffee, you know, we'd be out in the field. We just go sit on a stump and we'd talk. And I learned so much through that process but I didn't realize he was mentoring me the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the same thing I had, I had warrant officers around uh, and warrants were the same way that the old, old crusty warrants were always really good for sharing information. Yeah. And, and so they, they mentored me in a it, they reverse mentored me without me knowing it. Yeah. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, they get fixated on, you know, okay, I'm a, I'm a Lieutenant. I have to get mentored by, you know, a Colonel or, Mm -hmm. hey, maybe that happens maybe it doesn't happen find your mentors where they are yeah. find those people that give you good advice you know and 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 what uh what my warrant officer used to tell me one of my warrants my uh, w4s used to tell me was you find that person take them out to lunch buy them lunch yeah. break bread and start to talk and and let them kind of lead you along and it'll work you don't have to um you know, you don't have to wait in life. Those mentors are there. Yeah. You just have to find them and you can't, you can't get hung up on the, uh, you know, it's gotta be this, or it's gotta be, it's, uh, I'm a, I'm a man. So I have to have a male mentor. I'm a woman. So I have to have a, a woman mentor. It's not like that. You find your mentors yeah. wherever they are. And they are people who, you know, genuinely care about your well being and your future and your development. Uh, you know, they're out there. You sometimes you just got to find them, uh, but they're there. Yeah. That, that's helpful. I know it's going to be helpful to somebody watching because I feel like there's a, a degree of separation between the Gen Z, the um, you know Gen Xers, Millennials. And I feel like they're not being that communication to, hey, I've been what you've been through and I've succeeded in the field you want to succeed in. Do you want to emulate me free of charge? We can just be friends kind of thing. I, I wish there was more of that. Let's Let's wrap this up. Give me something genuine. Give me something brand new as a creative or a writer. Give me something that you wish more young men and women, especially veterans, would hear the first day getting out of the military um, about what's next. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I think the thing that I've always shared the most about what's next is is that you just don't know what's next and you never know what you need to know until you need to know it, yeah. uh, which is a really broad way of saying that you can go through transition from being, a, being, a, uh, you know, in uniform to out of uniform, the things you need to know, you're not going to know unless you find a mentor. And so it ties back to that whole mentorship thing. Um, and for my, me personally, as I got ready to retire, I didn't have a mentor and one day we had a civilian uh, uh, G6, our commo guy, yeah. and he was a GS-15 and he walked in my office one day and, and I'm a colonel and I'm sitting there at my desk and he said, Colonel, get out a notebook, start writing. 
And he literally charted my retirement path and post retirement, you know, the whole transit, he charted it out for me yeah. in like a 30 minute conversation from go, you know, go to the doctor, list everything, then go to the VA, do this, yeah. do that, do that. And, and, you know, I see him every once in a while and I say, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today had you not done that. He goes, oh, you'd have been fine. Like, no, <laughs> you know, I was, I was fumbling around trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. And and the typical transition services aren't very good. It was finding somebody who had who had gotten out of the army, you know, three or four years earlier, or gotten out of the military, who knew the path to take, and and could help me take that with the least amount of resistance, and 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 get to where I needed to go. And and that's something. I mean, that's genuinely find that individual, and that's mm-hmm. something you can't say enough. You, if you're going to get out of the army tomorrow, or get out of the Marine Corps, or the Navy, go find somebody who's done it within five yeah. years. Go buy him a beer. Go buy him lunch. Go buy him dinner. Go buy him drinks. Whatever it takes, and get him to talk to you and tell you what you need to know. Because it's not all the same for everybody. It's always a little bit different. Um, and those are the people that'll get you to where you need to go. Um, and the rest of it's just being yourself and pursuing what you want in life and not settling for something other than what you want in life, because you want to see the most miserable people out there. It's the people who separate uh, and and the veterans who have taken a path they didn't want to take yeah. because, hey, I just got a job and I'm doing this grind and they're miserable. And you're like, dude, you didn't have to do that. You could have done it differently. And we all need money. I get it. But if you want to be happy, figure out what makes you happy and pursue yeah. that and do what you want to do. Yeah. I always wanted to, I always wanted to teach. So teaching was a way to do what I wanted that'll still allow me to pursue my passions um, and, and have the freedom to pursue them. Uh, but, you know, how do you, how do you get to be, how do you get to teach? Right. Yeah. That's not an easy thing. And it was a fluke. Uh, really just, Good timing, good networking. The other piece of that is good networking. I knew the dean of the school of business, and 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 she offered me a job before I even retired. And said, "Hey, I got a job down here waiting for you." And I'm like, "I have no business background. I'm not I'm not a business guy." She's like, "That nah, doesn't matter. We'll figure it out." It, perfect, right? But yeah. it was the it was willingness to network and network over time because it took us about two or three years to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but but you know it, it gets to those are the kinds of things that. Um, you know, if you want to be a happy veteran, figure out what makes you happy and go after it. Yeah. Don't just don't just retire and then do the, grow the beard and do the slog. Yeah. Figure out what makes you happy. It's advice that I needed to hear, and not only myself but the people watching. So we'll wrap it up with Vet TV for everyone watching. This is an interview with Stephen Leonard, uh, an award-winning faculty member at the University of Kansas uh, School of Business. Um, the senior assistant dean and professor of the practice. It's been an honor having you and thank you for spending time with us. We really appreciate you. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. All right. Appreciate it.